So as all of you know, there are many ways to surgically correct a paraesophageal hernia. Um, in this video, I'm going to describe my preferred method, which is a robotic-assisted repair with an anterior fund duplication, and I'll try to describe my logic behind my decision as the video goes along. So the patient's an elderly woman with a classic type 3 paraesophageal hernia um, with severe symptoms. Um, you can see here on the coronal cuts where the fundus and the G junction is situated above the diaphragm. And here are the sagittal cuts. There you see the G junction. She has regurgitation and reflux. She definitely needs this fixed. So here's my port setup. You can see I use all four arms. I use a 30 degree down camera that's just to the left of the umbilicus so you're out of the way of the falciform ligament. I use an 8 millimeter air seal assistant port on the lateral edge and the patient's in steep reverse Trendelenburg position and my assistant's actually sitting on a sitting stool next to the patient and then I use a Nathanson liver retractor in the sub xiphoid space to retract the liver anteriorly. And so here's the operation. As always, it's going to be the whole operation beginning to end. There you get a good look at my port setup as we introduce the camera. This is a 30 degree camera and I'd say most of the time it's in the 30 degree down position. And this patient had had some prior surgery. I think she had a colon resection. So I just used the bipolar to get through that. You can use a spatula if you want. I think the bipolar in the highest setting is fine. There you see the parasophageal hernia there. And the first thing I'm going to do is sort of reduce that with my fourth arm. Now I'm not going to pull so hard that I create a, a, a tear on the uh, serosa of the stomach, but just kind of gently reducing it, and I'm getting through that gastrohepatic omentum with bipolar cautery. Now, sometimes you'll see a replaced left hepatic artery here. If it's a big branch, I'll preserve it and work around it. But if it's a small branch, here there's basically no branch, I'll just buzz through that stuff with bipolar cautery. And what I'm trying to do here is I'm dissecting out the right cruise of the diaphragm and I'm trying to get into that space between the, the muscle of the right cruise of the diaphragm and the hernia sac. And there's always that little line that you can see to get into that space. And this might be a good time to talk about uh, just the philosophy of reducing the hernia sac uh, and trying to preserve that plane between the hernia sac and the mediastinum and the, uh, and the cruise of the diaphragm. I don't go crazy about preserving that plane if it's hard to do. If it's easy to do and the plane separates easily, I'll go for it. And there you're starting to see kind of where the plane is between the hernia sac and the cruise sort of one cell layer off there. Um, I think it's more important in the really big parasophageal hernias, uh, reducing the hernia sac, because uh, you'll never get the stomach down uh, without dissecting out the hernia sac in a really big hernia, like a type 4 parasophageal hernia. This one isn't that big, so I'm not going to knock myself out trying to preserve that plane. Now, here, you're starting to see where the, the right and left crews come together posteriorly. There's the left cruise of the diaphragm and the right cruise of the diaphragm. And th seeing that landmark is actually a key part of the case. Um, here, I'm going to start dissecting out the left cruise of the diaphragm. Again, just using the bipolar cautery, I'm using my table side assistant to pull the stomach down and to the left, and with my fourth arm, I'm pulling everything to the right, and I'm just sort of dissecting that space between the gastroesophageal junction, you know, that angle of his area, and the left cruise of the diaphragm. Sometimes it's a little hard to define that there's a lot of, you know, this hernia has probably been there a long time. It's a little tricky to find that space, but we're starting to get into it. Again, I'm having my and, and the bottom right corner of the screen, my table side assistant is pulling the stomach towards the patient left. And now I'm just coming underneath the uh, esophagus, kind of at the GE junction with my fourth arm, which is the tip up, which is the long instrument. And you sort of see it there. And what I'm going to do is get a Penrose drain around 
the esophagus right at the GE junction and I'm going to use it as a retractor and this is a key part of the case in terms of uh, it's really the transition of the case where I'm able to kind of put some extra traction on this and really start moving along. This is the key step in the case, getting the Penrose strain around it at the angle of hiss. And you can see I just cut a little slit one third of the way through it. And I use that as a very gentle retractor and have my assistant just hold it up. And then this is where we get length on the esophagus. And for me, this is when uh, you see the true advantage of the robotic approach, mainly because of the visualization, which is so good. Um, but also being able to go way up into that posterior mediastinum and get lost to length on the esophagus. I can tell you, ooh, I think I just punctured into the um, right pleural space there. You can actually see we got into the pleural space. And at this point, I'm talking to my anesthesiologist. Keep an eye on your airway pressures. How are the hemodynamics doing? If I have to put in a little pigtail chest tube to decompress, I do it. I just scrub in real quick. And the, the I have one of those little Wayne pneumothorax kits at the bedside, and I can just pop it in. Um, but this patient was doing fine, as, as most of them will. And then I switched to the vessel sealer extend. And all I'm doing is I'm dividing the connective tissue attachments between the esophagus and the mediastinal structure. So the descending aorta is going to be right behind us here. I keep a little bit of a uh, margin away from the esophagus because I know the vagus nerve is going to be right up there. The, the posterior vagus nerve is going to be right up there along the esophagus can sort of see it there. It's kind of in incorporated in the Penrose drain. And I'm just using my vessel sealer extend here to go through this connective tissue and get good length on the esophagus. Remember we want three to four centimeters of length on the esophagus below the diaphragm without any tension. And we're, I mean, I mean you can already see we got good length. We're going to get more. Um, You know, I think uh, one of the reasons um, people get recurrences is because you just don't spend enough time getting good length on the esophagus, so there's, there's tension on it as it's below the diaphragm. And here I'm using my fourth arm to hold up on the Penrose, and I'm having my assistant kind of pull down on that gastric fat pad. And I'm going to encircle the entire esophagus, get all the way around it, and free it up from its connective tissue attachments in the chest. And I'm using my fourth arm and my assistant to really expose for me. Again, this is a uh, 30 degree down camera. And I'm just dividing the connective tissue attachments. Now, I think I've probably already gotten into the right-sided pleura. I'm going to try and stay a little bit closer to the esophagus here so I don't get into the left pleura. It's always worse getting into the left pleural space rather than the right pleural space because the, you have the, the liver kind of pushing up against the, the right diaphragm and the left side, the diaphragm will start, start pooching out towards you and it'll, it'll make your visualization tough if you get into the left pleura. Here I'm just dividing some of the omental fat where it's stuck to the underside of the diaphragm next to the left cruise. So for parasophageal hernias, I like to reinforce it with bioabsorbable mesh. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But what I'm doing here is cleaning up the underside of the diaphragm so I can get my mesh seated nice and flush up against the diaphragm. There you can see the, uh, the confluence of the cruise posteriorly. And I'm basically just cleaning up the cruise now so that I can put my stitches. And 
there's some more attachments between the esophagus and the mediastinum. I think you can decide how you're going to spend your time. You can spend your time dissecting out that hernia sac very meticulously and get the whole thing out, or you can just get length on the esophagus. And I think sometimes it's a little bit more expedient just to lengthen the esophagus. It feels like we have pretty good length here now. There's no tension on it. It's below the diaphragm. And what I want to do now is excise that gastric fat pad so we can clearly um, see the uh, anatomy, mainly seeing exactly where the angle of hiss is. So I use my uh, vessel sealer extend to sort of dissect that plane between the gastric fat pad and the stomach itself. And we're just going to excise that fat pad. Notice I stay right on the stomach wall. And we're going to take this all the way to the angle of hiss. Now the, the thing I'm um, aware of is the anterior vagus nerve. And I don't want to take this too far because I don't want to compromise the anterior vagus nerve. Sometimes the anterior vagus nerve is a hard structure to see. But it's going to start on the left side of the esophagus and it's going to kind of angle down anteriorly. And right there, there's the gastric fat pad that we've taken off. And we should be able to see the angle of his nice and clear now. Really define it. There's the angle of hiss right there. And it's nicely situated below the diaphragm without any tension. And there's a little bit of extra fat there. And just for um, a little extra security, I'm going to see if I can get a little more in length on the esophagus. And again, this is the beauty of the robot. There you see the de descending aorta. Your visualization is so good with the robot. And your dexterity, your manual de dexterity in these tight spaces. This is kind of like a, uh, you know, what the urologists do for a prostate dissection turned upside down. You know, they're in, they're in a tight space down in the pelvis. Now we're in a tight space up in the mediastinum, but we still have full dexterity. And again, I'm just sort of mobilizing I'm getting a little bit more, you know, maybe another centimeter of length on the uh, esophagus. And again, I'm not staying right on the wall of the esophagus. I'm leaving just a little bit of a margin because I know the vagus nerve is going to be there, and I just want to make sure that I stay clear of the vagus nerve. You see how I'm using my fourth arm to kind of exposed for myself a little bit and there you're starting to see the vagus nerve below me so I'm above I'm trying to stay above the vagus nerve lateral to the vagus nerve protect the vagus nerve and that looks like a safe plane there These moves here are just giving me literally maybe another centimeter, another two centimeters of length. And I sort of look at it 360 degrees, so now I'm looking at it from underneath. There's a little bit of a mental fat just kind of in our way. And below us you can see the descending aorta. And these are just some attachments. Now I'm going to look at the GE junction again. So I've gotten, let's see, did I get more length? A little bit more length. The angle of hiss is going to be right there. 
really want to see that that clearly defined anatomically. I think there's just some sort of connective tissue right at the angle of his kind of puckering it a little bit. And there you're kind of seeing the vagus nerve again curling up to the left. I'm staying away from it. I'm getting a little bit more length on the left lateral side of the esophagus. Here's where you can easily get into the left pleural space. But the diaphragm looks okay. It doesn't look like we've gotten into it yet. I do a lot of this putting the penrose on, taking it off. That's why I think the slit is very good. I think it's good for retraction, but when you're actually dissecting off the fat pad, um, it can kind of get in your way. So I sort of, I sort of, uh, you know, use it as a retractor, and then I'll and then I'll open it up. And I think we've got our cruise well exposed now, and we're going to start putting in our stitches. And you can see I'm holding up on the penrose with my fourth arm. I'm having my assistant hold the omentum away. And I like to use just simple stitches. This is a uh, zero ethabond. And see how I've preserved that peritoneal um, cell layer around the cruise? I think that's important just to, for the integrity of the stitches so they don't tear through. And I don't use any pledgets on these. I think those can get in the way. But I'm real gentle about how um, I manipulate the stitch, I kind of feed the stitch to my assistant, and we're going to tie it using the TK or tie knot knot pusher. The table side assistant's going to do that. And I think it's a very secure knot. There's this little grommet. Um, you know, you can do the intercorporeal. Oh, I think for some reason that one pulled through. One other thing I should mention is. I use the vessel sealer extend as a needle driver. It's it's a great it actually works as well or better than the robotic needle driver. And you don't have to open up a new instrument. And it's got a cutting function on it as well, so you can actually cut with it. Um, so it's like a suture cut. And uh, I pass that to the table set assistant and watch how I feed the suture to him. So I'm kind of pulling myself in a Rather than in a shearing direction, I'm just pulling in the same direction uh, as the muscle fibers. And then I hold it with my fourth arm. So when my table side assistant is putting on the, uh, the little grommet, um, there's no tension on it. And then they come in with the TK knot pusher and tie the knot down. It is, in my opinion, the most secure knot. I don't do figure of eight stitches. I just do simple stitches. Um, you know, this is the this is the hernia repair. Um, now I'm going to reinforce it with mesh, bioabsorbable mesh that'll become scar tissue uh, in three or four months. But I'm not going to use pledgets because you know, let's face it, if we have to come back, you don't want it to be a mess. And you can see I've sort of preserve that peritoneal layer over the cruise. I'm feeding the stitch to my table side assistant. I'm using my fourth arm to hold up on that Penrose drain. And this is stitch number two. It looks like we're going to need at least one more. I don't use a uh, bougie in these. I used to, but I don't think it's necessary. I think if you create kind of a, a snug closure around the esophagus, it's kind of like maybe just uh, the tip of your instrument can fit up through there. I think that's fine. And I don't do a 360 degree wrap. I do a partial wrap, so I don't think uh, uh, bougie is necessary. And, you know, and, and also if you don't put a bougie, you avoid that whole potential for injury. Um, which shouldn't be overlooked. So there's my third posterior stitch. 
I think the posterior stitches are the most important. If the hernia is going to recur, it's usually going to recur posteriorly, in my experience. Every once in a while, you'll need an anterior stitch. And I'll always look at that and see if we need one, but the posterior stitches are the most important. And that's where I'm going to reinforce them with the mesh that you'll see in a minute. Trying to hold that omento fat away with my vessel sealer. And there's another nice stitch. And I look anteriorly, and there's a little bit of a space, and it looks like she could probably use one anterior stitch. This vessel sealer extend is like one of my favorite instruments. It is so, it has so many. Um, useful features. It burns, it cuts, it, um, it's got good grip strength, but not too much. So here's my anterior stitch, and that looks like a nice snug closure around the esophagus. And look how we have, you know, our three to four centimeters of length. There's no tension. I'm going to suck out some of that fluid so we can see the, um, the diaphragm underneath. And this is where we're going to be putting the mesh. Really freeing up all that, all those attachments. a little bit of omento fat there that's kind of in our way, just sort of obscuring things. But again, th the reason for my doing this is so that the mesh is lying nice and flush up against the underside of the diaphragm. Um, which hopefully, you know, the, the, the cleaner the mesh lays, the, the better it'll adhere and the fewer recurrences we'll have. And I think at this point we're probably ready to put the mesh in. I use, it's called uh, A-cell. I think it's made out of pig bladder. Um, and it, the reason I like this particular mesh is, first of all, it's bioabsorbable, so it'll eventually kind of morph into scar tissue. And it's easy to work with, it's pretty thin. It's easy for the table side assistant to push it in, and it's easy for me to work with when I have it in there. And basically, I'm laying it in a U-shaped fashion around the uh, posterior cruise, and I just tack it to the underside of the diaphragm with you know three or four tacking stitches. And again, so these are these are two O at the bond as opposed to the zero at the bond that I use in the diaphragm cruise. And again, I'm just having the table side assistant use the TK knot pusher. The um, I like the TK knot pusher knots for a variety of reasons. Number one is I think it's a very secure uh, knot, and I know a lot of people do intercorporeal suturing, which we can do. I can do that, but um, I think this is actually a little bit faster, and I think it's a little bit more secure knot in my hands. You know. If you've done, you know, if you had your 10,000 hours of intercorporeal suturing, maybe, maybe uh, it's faster for you to just tie it. And see, there's there's uh, my posterior uh, anchoring stitch that I really put right on the cruise, and um, and we'll tie that down. And that mesh is going to sort of anneal to the underside of the diaphragm there. And it looks like it's in pretty good position. And now it looks like it's time to start the fundoplication. There's the 
angle of hiss, the G junction. Um, we've got three to four centimeters of length. Uh, this is probably a good time to start talking about my philosophy for fund application. I know it's all over the map, and you know this debate is as old as surgery itself in terms of whether you should do a 360 degree wrap or a partial wrap. I like to do a partial wrap, and I like to do it anteriorly. Um, and I'll explain my reasoning. Uh, and, and you see there, I'm just kind of pulling it over, uh, just kind of making sure we have enough mobility. And I'm going to fire my first stitch, which is going to be right at that angle of hiss. It's going to be right between the stomach and the esophagus, right at the GE junction. And see how I'm going to grab a little bit of that mesh in the diaphragm with that? Because not only am I doing a partial anterior fund application, I'm also doing a gastropexy. And this has different eponyms. Some people call it a door. Some people call it a Watson. Um, these are 2 ethabons, by the way. In my experience, the 360 degree wrap can create a bunch of problems. Even if you do it over a bougie, it can cause gas bloating, which is very uncomfortable to patients. In some, in some cases, or I'd say in many cases, the gas bloating is even more bothersome than the reflux. Um, and I think the uh, the patients with the big parasophageal hernias, their main problems are due to the fact that the stomach is herniated up in the chest. And, and just by reducing the stomach back into the abdomen with three or four centimeters of um, intra-abdominal length on the distal esophagus, you're going to correct most of their symptoms. And this is just going to help uh, prevent a little bit of reflux and prevent recurrence by sort of anchoring everything down below the diaphragm. Um, I also... You know, in terms of arguing whether to do an anterior fund application or a posterior toupee, and see how I'm grabbing the diaphragm there with that? So this is actually a gastropexy in addition to an anterior fund application. Uh, but in terms of doing a posterior wrap versus an anterior partial wrap, you know, a toupee versus a, a door or Watson, um, I like this a little bit better because I think it goes a little bit faster. Um, I don't have to take down the short gastric vessels. And I think that can create a little bit of ischemia to the to the to the fundus of the stomach. I think it can create a little bit of ischemia to the spleen, and that may have consequences. Um, you know, I mean, I don't think there's any uh, real obvious advantages to a posterior partial wrap versus an anterior partial wrap, and I think uh, this is uh, a little bit easier, a little bit faster. Usually it's four or five stitches. It's two on one side, two on the other side, and then sometimes I'll put one extra stitch just so it lays down nice and flat. So you see I'll put one last stitch there. The other thing is, is these patients tend to have uh, decreased motility, particularly the real big esophageal, uh, parasophageal hernias, and um, and even if you're careful about preserving the vagus nerves, they have decreased peristalsis, they have delayed gastric emptying, and I think uh, doing uh, a full wrap uh, creates a lot of problems for them. So I just do a partial anterior wrap. And that looks like, um, you know, the anterior partial fund application the way I like it. Um, we'll retrieve all that uh, omental fat, the hernia sac contents, through a little bag. And the last thing I'll do is I'll have an esophagus scope, and I'll usually run it down, and I'll look at the the uh, the repair from the inside. Make sure the G junctions below the diaphragm, and you can see there I've sort of run the esophagus scope in there, and it's just kind of the finishing touch, um, just making sure everything looks perfect. And then I'll suck out the stomach, and they'll go home the next morning on a full liquid diet. So that's my method of fixing a parasophageal hernia. Um, if you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear them. Um, just reach out to me. Thanks for watching.